That's right. It is once again the weirding hour. Let's see, tonight. Wow, I'm still not allowed to tag anyone. Well, gang, I find that strange, but I will tag some folks after the fact. Going to require further investigation. Good evening. I'm Douglas Willem. And we've been reading William Hope Hodgson's The House on the Borderland. Uh, we've, we've made it this far here to begin chapter 15 tonight. The Noise in the Night. And now I came to the strangest of all the strange happenings that had befallen me in this house of mysteries. It occurred quite lately within the month, and I have little doubt but that what I saw was, in reality, the end of all things. However, to my story. I do not know how it is, but up to the present, I have never been able to write these things down. Directly, they happened. It is as though I have to wait a time, recovering my just balance and digesting, as it were, the things I have heard and seen. No doubt this is as it should be, for by waiting I see the incidents more truly, and write of them in a calmer and more judicial frame of mind. This, by the way. It is now the end of November. My story relates to what happened in the first week of the month. It was night, about eleven o'clock. Pepper and I kept one another company in the study that great old room of mine where I read and work, I was reading, curiously enough, the Bible. I have begun in these later days to take a growing interest in that great and ancient book. Suddenly a distinct tremor shook the house, and there came a faint and distant whirring buzz that grew rapidly into a far, muffled screaming. It reminded me, in a queer, gigantic way, of the noise that a clock makes when the catch is released and it is allowed to run down. The sound appeared to come from some remote height, somewhere up in the night. There was no repetition of the shock. I looked across at Pepper. He was sleeping peacefully. Gradually, the whirring noise decreased, and there came a long silence. All at once, a glow lit up the end window, which protrudes far out from the side of the house, so that from it one may look both east and west. I felt puzzled, and after a moment's hesitation, walked across the room and pulled aside the blind. As I did so, I saw the sun rise from behind the horizon. It rose with a steady, perceptible movement. I could see it travel upward. In a minute, it seemed, it had reached the tops of the trees through which I had watched it, up, up, it was broad daylight now. Behind me, I was conscious of a sharp, mosquito-like buzzing. I glanced round and knew that it came from the clock. Even as I looked, it marked off an hour. The minute hand was moving around the dial faster than an ordinary second hand. The hour hand moved quickly from space to space. I had a numb sense of astonishment. A moment later, so it seemed, the two candles went out almost together. I turned swiftly back to the window, for I had seen the shadow of the window frames traveling along the floor toward me as though a great lamp had been carried up past the window. I saw now that the sun had risen high into the heavens and was still visibly moving. It passed above the house with an extraordinary sailing kind of motion. As the window came into shadow, I saw another extraordinary thing. The fine weather clouds were not passing easily across the sky. They were scampering as though a hundred mile an hour wind blew. As they passed, they changed their shapes a thousand times a minute as though writhing with a strange life, and so were gone. And presently others came and whisked away likewise. To the west, 
I saw the sun drop with an incredible, smooth, swift motion. Eastward, the shadows of every seen thing crept toward the coming grayness, and the movement of the shadows was visible to me, a stealthy, writhing creep of the shadows of the wind-stirred trees. It was a strange sight. Quickly, the room began to darken. The sun slid down to the horizon and seemed, as it were, to disappear from my sight, almost with a jerk. Through the grayness of the swift evening, I saw the silver crescent of the moon falling out of the southern sky toward the west. The evening seemed to merge into an almost instant night. Above me, the many constellations passed in a strange, noiseless circling westward. The moon fell through that last thousand fathoms of the night gulf, and there was only the starlight. About this time, the buzzing in the corner ceased, telling me that the clock had run down. A few minutes passed, and I saw the eastward sky lighten. A gray, sullen morning spread through all the darkness and hid the march of the stars. Overhead, there moved, with a heavy, everlasting rolling, a vast, seamless sky of gray clouds, a cloud sky that would have seemed motionless through all the length of an ordinary Earth day. The sun was hidden from me, but from moment to moment the world would brighten and darken, brighten and darken beneath waves of subtle light and shadow. The light shifted ever westward, and the night fell upon the earth. A vast rain seemed to come with it, and a wind of a most extraordinary loudness, as though the howling of a night-long gale were packed into the space of no more than a minute. This noise passed almost immediately, and the clouds broke so that once more I could see the sky. The stars were flying westward with astounding speed. It came to me now, for the first time, that though the noise of the wind had passed, yet a constant blurred sound was in my ears. Now that I noticed it, I was aware that it had been with me all the time. It was the world noise. And then, even as I grasped at so much comprehension, there came the eastward light. No more than a few heartbeats, and the sun rose swiftly. Through the trees I saw it, and then it was above the trees. Up, up, it soared, and all the world was light. It passed with a swift, steady swing to its highest altitude, and fell thence westward. I saw the day roll visibly over my head. A few light clouds flittered northward and vanished. The sun went down with one swift, clear plunge, and there was about me. For a few seconds, the darker, growing gray of the gloaming. Southward and westward, the moon was sinking rapidly. The night had come already. A minute, it seemed, and the moon fell those remaining fathoms of dark sky. Another minute or so, and the, the eastward sky glowed with the coming dawn. The sun leapt upon me with a frightening abruptness and soared ever more swiftly toward the zenith, then suddenly a fresh thing came to my sight. A black thundercloud rushed up out of the south and seemed to leap all the arc of the sky in a single instant. As it came, I saw that its advance advancing edge flapped like a monstrous black cloth in the heaven, twirling and undulating rapidly with a horrid suggestiveness. In an instant, all the air was full of rain, and a hundred lightning flashes seemed to flood downward as as it were in one great shower. In the same second of time, the world noise was drowned in the roar of the wind, and then my ears ached under the stunning impact of the thunder. And in the midst of this storm, the night came, and then within the space of another minute, the storm had passed, and there was only the constant blur of the world noise on my hearing. Overhead, the stars were sliding quickly westward, and something, mayhaps the particular speed to which they had attained, brought home to me for the first time a keen realization of the knowledge that it was the world that revolved. I seemed to see suddenly the world, a vast dark mass revolving visibly against the stars. The dawn and the sun seemed to come together. So greatly had the speed of the world revolution increased the sun drove up in one long, steady curve, passed its highest point, and swept down into the westward sky and disappeared. 
I was scarcely conscious of evening, so brief was it. Then I was watching the flying constellations and the westward hastening moon. In but a space of seconds, so it seemed, it was sliding swiftly downward through the night blue, and then was gone, and almost directly came the morning. And now there seemed to come a strange acceleration. The sun made one clean, clear sweep through the sky and disappeared behind the westward horizon. And the night came and went with a like haste. As the succeeding day opened and closed upon the world, I was aware of a sweat of snow suddenly upon the earth. The night came, and almost immediately the day, in the brief leap of the sun, I saw that the snow had vanished, and then once more it was night. Thus matters were, and even after the many incredible things that I have, I have seen, I experienced all the time a most profound awe. To see the sun rise and set within a space of time to be measured by seconds, to watch after a little the moon leap a pale and ever-growing orb up into the night sky and glide with a strange swiftness through the vast arc of blue, and presently to see the sun follow, springing out of the eastern sky as though in chase, and then again the night, with the swift and ghostly passing of starry constellations, was all too much to view believingly. Yet so it was. The day slipped from dawn to dusk, and the night sliding swiftly into day ever rapidly and more rapidly. The last three passages of the sun had shown me a snow-covered earth, which at night had seemed for a few seconds incredibly weird until the fast-shifting light of the soaring and falling moon. Now, however, for a little space, the sky was hidden by a sea of swaying leaden-white clouds, which lightened and blackened alternately with the passage of day and night. The clouds rippled and vanished, and there was once more before me the vision of the swiftly leaping sun, and nights that came and went like shadows. Faster and faster spun the world, and now each day and night was completed within the space of but a few seconds, and still the speed increased. It was a little later that I noticed that the sun had begun to have the, the suspicion of a trail of fire behind it. This was due, evidently, to the speed at which it apparently traversed the heavens. And as the days sped, each one quicker than the last, the sun began to assume the appearance of a vast flaming comet, flaring across the sky at short, periodic intervals. At night, the moon presented, with much greater truth, a comet-like aspect, a pale and singularly clear, fast-traveling shape of fire, trailing streaks of cold flame. The stars showed now, merely as fine hairs of fire against the dark. Once I turned from the window and glanced at Pepper. In the flash of a day I saw that he slept quietly, and I moved once more to my watching. The sun was now bursting up from the eastern horizon like a stupendous rocket, seeming to occupy no more than a second or two in hurling from east to west. I could no longer perceive the passage of clouds across the sky, which seemed to have darkened somewhat. The brief nights appeared to have lost the proper darkness of night, so that the hair-like fire of the flying stars showed but dimly. As the speed increased, the sun began to sway very slowly in the sky from south to north, and then slowly again from north to south. So, amid a strange confusion of mind, the hours passed. All this while had Pepper slept. Presently, feeling lonely and distraught, I called to him softly, but he took no notice. Again I called, raising my voice slightly. Still he moved not. I walked over to where he lay and touched him with my foot to rouse him. At the action, gentle though it was, he fell to pieces. That is what happened. He literally and actually crumbled into a moldering heap of bones and dust. For the space of perhaps a minute, I stared down at the shapeless heap that had once been pepper. I stood, feeling stunned. What can have happened, I asked myself, not at once grasping the grim significance of that little hill of ash. Then, as I stirred the heap with my foot, it occurred to me that this could only happen in a great space of time. Years and years. Outside, the weaving, fluttering light held the world. 
Inside, I stood, trying to understand what it meant, what that little pile of dust and dry bones on the carpet meant, but I could not think coherently. I glanced away, round the room, and now for the first time noticed how dusty and old the place looked. Dust and dirt everywhere, piled in little heaps in the corners, and spread about upon the furniture. The very carpet itself was invisible beneath a coating of the same, all-pervading material. As I walked, little clouds of the stuff rose up from under my footsteps and assailed my nostrils, with a dry, bitter odor that made me wheeze huskily. Suddenly... As my glance fell again upon Pepper's remains, I stood still and gave voice to my confusion, questioning aloud whether the years were indeed passing, whether this which I had taken to be a form of vision was in truth a reality. I paused. A new thought had struck me, quickly, but with steps which for the first time I noticed tottered. I went across the room to the great pier glass and looked in. It was too covered with grime to give back any reflection, and with trembling hands I began to rub off the dirt. Presently I could see myself. The thought that had come to me was confirmed. Instead of the great hale man who scarcely looked fifty, I was looking at a bent, decrepit man whose shoulders stooped and whose face was wrinkled with the years of a century. The hair which a few short hours ago had been nearly coal black, was now silvery white. Only the eyes were bright. Gradually I traced in that ancient man a faint resemblance to myself of other days. I turned away and tottered to the window. I knew now that I was old, and the knowledge seemed to confirm my trembling walk. For a little space I stared moodily out into the blurred vista of changeful landscape. Even in that short time, a year passed, and with a petulant gesture I left the window. As I did so, I noticed that my hand shook with the palsy of old age, and a short sob choked its way through my lips. For a little while I paced tremulously between the window and the, the table, my gaze wandering hither and thither uneasily. How dilapidated the room was. Everywhere lay the thick dust, thick, sleepy, and black. The fender was a shape of rust. The chains that held the brass clock weights had rusted through long ago, and now the weights lay on the floor beneath themselves, two cones of vertigris. As I glanced about, it seemed to me that I could see the very furniture of the room rotting and decaying before my eyes. Nor was this fancy on my part, for all at once the bookshelf along the sidewall collapsed, with a cracking and rending of rotten wood precipitating its contents upon the floor and filling the room with a smother of dusty atoms. How tired I felt! As I walked, it seemed that I, I could hear my dry joints creak and crack at every step. I wondered about my sister. Was she dead as well as Pepper? All had happened so quickly and suddenly. This must be indeed the beginning of the end of all things. It occurred to me to go to look for her, but I felt too weary. And then she had been so queer about these happenings of late. Of late, I repeated the words and laughed feebly, mirthlessly, as the realization was borne in upon me that I spoke of a time half a century gone. Half a century. It might have been twice as long. I moved slowly to the window and looked out once more across the world. I can best describe the passage of day and night at this period as a sort of gigantic, ponderous flicker. Moment by moment, the acceleration of time continued, so that at nights now I saw the moon only as a swaying trail of palish fire that varied from a mere line of light to a nebulous path and then dwindled again, disappearing periodically. The flicker of the days and nights quickened. The days had grown perceptively darker, and a queer quality of dusk lay, as it were, in the atmosphere. The nights were so much lighter that the stars were scarcely to be seen, saving here and there an occasional hair-like line of fire that seemed to sway a little with the moon. Quicker and ever quicker ran the flicker of day and night, and suddenly it seemed I was aware that the flicker had died out, and instead there reigned a comparatively steady light, which was shed upon all the world, from an eternal river of flame that swung up and down, north and south, 
in stupendous, mighty swings. The sky was now grown very much darker, and there was in the blue of it a heavy gloom, as though a vast blackness peered through it upon the earth. Yet there was in it also a strange and awful clearness and emptiness. Periodically I had glimpses of a ghostly track of fire that swayed thin and darkly toward the sunstream, vanished and reappeared. It was the scarcely visible moonstream. Looking out at the landscape, I was conscious again of a blurring sort of flitter that came either from the light of the ponderous swinging sun stream or was the result of the incredibly rapid changes of the Earth's surface. And every few moments, so it seemed, the snow would lie suddenly upon the world and vanish as abruptly as though an invisible giant flitted a white sheet off and on the Earth. Time fled and the weariness that was mine grew insupportable. I turned from the window and walked once across the room, the heavy dust deadening the sound of my footsteps. Each step that I took seemed a greater effort than the one before. An intolerable ache knew me in every joint and limb as I trod my way with a weary uncertainty. By the opposite wall, I came to a weak pause, and wondered dimly what was my intent. I looked to my left and saw my old chair. The thought of sitting in it brought a faint sense of comfort to my bewildered wretchedness. Yet, because I was so weary and old and tired, I would scarcely brace my mind to do anything but stand and wish myself past those few yards. I rocked as I stood. The floor even seemed a place for rest, but the dust lay so thick and sleepy and black. I turned with a great effort of will and made toward my chair. I reached it with a groan of thankfulness and sat down. Everything about me appeared to be growing dim. It was all so strange and unthought of. Last night I was a comparatively strong, though elderly man, and now only a few hours later... I looked at the little dust heap that had once been pepper. Hours! And I laughed, a feeble, bitter laugh, a shrill, cackling laugh that shocked my dimming senses. For a while I, I must have dozed. Then I opened my eyes with a start. Somewhere across the room, there had been a muffled noise of something falling. I looked and saw, vaguely, a cloud of dust hovering above a pile of debris. Nearer the door, something else tumbled with a crash. It was one of the cupboards, but I was tired and took little not notice. I closed my eyes and sat there in a state of drowsy semi-unconsciousness. Once or twice, as though coming through thick mists, I heard noises faintly. Then I must have slept. Chapter 16 The Awakening I awoke with a start. For a moment I wondered where I was, then memory came to me. The room was still lit with that strange light, half sun, half moon light. I felt refreshed, and the tired, weary ache had left me. I went slowly across to the window and looked out. Overhead, the river of flame drove up and down, north and south, in a dancing semicircle of fire. As a mighty sleigh in the loom of time, it seemed, in a sudden fancy of mine, to be beating home the picks of the years. For so vastly had the passage of time been accelerated that there was no longer any sense of the sun passing from east to west. The only apparent movement was the north and south beat of the sun stream that had become so swift now as to be better described as a quiver. As I peered out, there came to me a sudden inconsequent memory of that last journey among the outer worlds. I remembered the sudden vision that had come to me as I neared the solar system of the fast whirling planets about the sun, as though the governing quality of time had been held in abeyance and the machine of a universe allowed to run down an eternity in a few moments or hours. 
the memory passed, along with a but partially comprehended suggestion that I had been permitted a glimpse into further time spaces. I stared out again, seemingly at the quake of the sun stream. The speed seemed to increase even as I looked. Several lifetimes came and went as I watched. Suddenly it struck me with a sort of grotesque seriousness that I was still alive. I thought of Pepper and wondered how it was that I had not followed his fate. He had reached the time of his dying and had passed, probably through sheer lengths of years. And here was I, alive, hundreds of thousands of centuries after my rightful period of years. For a time, I mused absently. Yesterday, I stopped suddenly. Yesterday? There was no yesterday. The yesterday of which I spoke had been swallowed up in the abyss of years, ages gone. I grew dazed with such thinking. Presently, I turned from the window and glanced round the room. It seemed different, strangely, utterly different. Then I knew what it was that made it appear so strange. It was bare. There was not a piece of furniture in the room, not even a solitary fitting of any sort. Gradually, my amazement went as I remembered that this was but the inevitable end of that process of decay which I had witnessed commencing before my sleep thousands of years, millions of years. Over the floor was spread a deep layer of dust that reached halfway up to the window seat. It had grown immeasurably whilst I slept and represented the dust of untold ages. Undoubtedly, atoms of the old decayed furniture helped to swell its bulk and somewhere among it all smoldered the long ago dead pepper. All at once it occurred to me that I had no recollection of wading knee-deep through all that dust after I awoke. True, an incredible age of years had passed since I approached the window, but that was evidently as nothing compared with the countless spaces of time that I conceived had vanished whilst I was sleeping. I remembered now that I had fallen asleep sitting in my old chair. Had it gone? I glanced toward where it had stood. Of course there was no chair to be seen. I could not satisfy myself whether it had disappeared after my waking or before. If it had moldered under me, surely I should have been waked by the collapse. Then I remembered that the thick dust which covered the floor would have been sufficient to soften my fall. So that it was quite possible I had slept upon the dust for a million years or more. As these thoughts wandered through my brain, I glanced again, casually, to where the chair had stood. Then, for the first time, I noticed that there were no marks in the dust of my footprints between it and the window. But then ages of years had passed since I had awaked, tens of thousands of years. My look rested thoughtfully again upon the place where once had stood my chair. Suddenly, I passed from abstraction to intentness, for there, in its standing place, I made out, made out a long undulation rounded off with the heavy dust. Yet it was not so much hidden, but that I could tell what had caused it. I knew, and shivered at the knowledge, that it was a human body, ages dead, lying there, beneath the place where I had slept. It was lying on its right side, its back tor turned toward me. I could make out and trace each curve and outline, softened and molded, as it were, in the black dust. In a vague sort of way, I tried to account for its presence there. Slowly, I began to grow bewildered as the thought came to me that it lay just about where I must have fallen when the chair collapsed. Gradually, an idea began to form itself within my brain, a thought that shook my spirit. It seemed hideous and insupportable, yet it grew upon me steadily until it became a conviction. The body under that coating, that shroud of dust, was neither more nor less than my own dead shell. I did not attempt to prove it. I, I knew it now, and wondered I had not known it all along. I was a bodiless thing. A while I stood, trying to adjust my thoughts to this new problem. In time, how many thousands of years I know not, I attained to some degree of quietude, sufficient to enable me to pay attention to what was transpiring around me. Now. I saw that the elongated mound had sunk, collapsed 
level with the rest of the spreading dust, and fresh atoms, impalpable, had settled about, uh, settled above that mixture of grave powder which the aeons had ground. A long while I stood, turned from the window. Gradually I grew more collected, while the world slipped across the centuries into the future. Presently I began a survey of the room. Now I saw that time was beginning its destructive work, even on this strange old building. That it had stood through all the years was, it seemed to me, proof that it was something different from any other house. I do not think, somehow, that I had thought of its decaying. Though why, I could not have said. It was not until I had meditated upon the matter for some considerable time that I fully realized that the extraordinary space of time through which it had stood was sufficient to have utterly pulverized the very stones of which it was built, had they been taken from any earthly quarry. Yes, it was undoubtedly moldering now. All the plaster had gone from the walls, even as the woodwork of the room had gone many ages before. While I stood, in contemplation, a piece of glass from one of the small diamond-shaped panes dropped with a dull tap amid the dust upon the, uh, upon the sill behind me, and crumbled into a little heap of powder. As I turned from contemplating it, I saw light between a couple of the stones that formed the outer wall. Evidently, the mortar was falling away. After a while, I turned once more to the window and peered out. I discovered now that the speed of time had become enormous. The lateral quiver of the sun stream had grown so swift as to cause the dancing semicircle of flame to merge into and disappear in a sheet of fire that covered half the southern sky from east to west. From the sky, I glanced down to the gardens. They were just a blur of a palish, dirty green. I had a feeling that they stood higher than in the old days, a feeling that they were nearer to my window, as though they had risen bodily. Yet they were still a long way below me, for the rock over the mouth of the pit on which this house stands arches up to a great height. It was later that I noticed a change in the constant color of the gardens. The pale, dirty green was growing ever paler and paler toward white. At last, after a great space, they became grayish-white, and stayed thus for a very long time. Finally, however, the grayness began to fade, even as had the green, into a dead white. And this remained, constant and unchanged, and by this I knew that, at last, snow lay upon all the northern world. And so, by millions of years, time winged onward through eternity to the end, the end of which in the old earth days I had thought remotely and in hazily speculative fashion. And now it was approaching in a manner of which none had ever dreamed. I recollect that about this time I began to have a lively, though morbid, curiosity as to what would happen when the end came. But I seemed strangely without imaginings. All this while, the steady process of decay was continuing. The few remaining pieces of glass had long ago vanished, and every now and then a soft thud and a little cloud of rising dust would tell of some fragment of fallen mortar or stone. I looked up again to the fiery sheet that quaked in the heavens above me and far down in the southern sky. As I looked, the impression was borne in upon me that it had lost some of its fi first brilliancy, that it was duller deeper hued. I glanced down once more to the blurred white of the worldscape. Sometimes my look returned to the burning sheet of dulling flame that was and yet hid the sun. At times I glanced behind me into the growing dusk of the great silent room with its aeon carpet of sleeping dust. So I watched through the fleeting ages, lost in soul-wearing thoughts and wondering and possessed with a new weariness. Chapter 17, The Slowing Rotation It might have been a million years later that I perceived, beyond possibility of doubt, that the fiery sheet that lit the world was indeed darkening. 
Another vast space went by, and the whole enormous flame had sunk to a deep copper color. Gradually it darkened from copper to copper red, and from this at times to a deep, heavy, purplish tint, with in it a strange loom of blood. Although the light was decreasing, I could perceive no diminishment in the apparent speed of the sun. It still spread itself in that dazzling veil of speed. The world, so much of it as I could see, had assumed a dreadful shade of gloom, as though, in very deed, the last day of the world's approached. The sun was dying, of that there could be little doubt, and still the earth whirled onward through space and all the aeons. At this time, I remember, an extraordinary sense of bewilderment took me. I found myself, later, wandering mentally amid an odd chaos of fragmentary modern theories and the old biblical story of the world's ending. Then, for the first time, there flashed across me the memory that the sun, with its system of planets, was and had been traveling through space at an incredible speed. Abruptly, the question rose, where? For a very great time, I pondered this matter, but finally, with a certain sense of the futility of my puzzlings, I let my thoughts wander to other things. I grew to wondering how much longer the house would stand. Also, I queried to myself whether I should be doomed to stay bodiless upon the earth through the dark time that I knew was coming. From these thoughts, I fell again to speculations upon the possible direction of the sun's journey through space. And so another great while passed. Gradually, as time fled, I began to feel the chill of a great winter. Then I remembered that with the sun dying, the cold must be necessarily extraordinarily intense. Slowly, slowly, as the aeons slipped into eternity, the earth sank into a heavier and redder gloom. The dull flame in the firmament took on a deeper tint, very somber and turbid. Then, at last, it was borne upon me that there was a change. The fiery, gloomy curtain of flame that hung quaking overhead and down away into the southern sky began to thin and contract, and in it, as one sees the fast vibrations of a jarred harp string, I saw once more the sun stream quivering giddily north and south. Slowly, the likeness to a sheet of fire disappeared and I saw plainly the slowing beat of the sun stream. Yet, even then, the speed of its swing was inconceivably swift, and all the time the brightness of the fiery arc grew ever duller. Underneath, the world loomed dimly, an indistinct, ghostly region. Overhead, the river of flame swayed slower, and even slower, until at last it swung to the north and south in great ponderous beats that lasted through seconds. A long space went by, and now each sway of the great belt lasted nigh a minute, so that after a great while I ceased to distinguish it as a visible movement, and the streaming fire ran in a steady river of dull flame across the deadly-looking sky. An indefinite period passed, and it seemed that the arc of fire became less sharply defined. It appeared to me to grow more attenuated, and I thought blackish streaks showed occasionally. Presently, as I watched, the smooth onward flow ceased, and I was able to perceive that there came a momentary but regular darkening of the world. This grew until once more night descended in short but periodic intervals upon the wearying earth. Longer and longer became the nights, and the days equaled them, so that at last, the day and the night grew to the duration of seconds in length, and the sun showed, once more, like an almost invisible, coppery-red colored ball, within the glowing mistiness of its flight, corresponding to the dark lines showing at times in, in its trail. There were now distinctly to be seen on the half-visible sun itself great dark belts. Year after year flashed into the past, and the days and nights spread into minutes. The sun had ceased to have the appearance of a tail, and now rose and set, a tremendous globe of a glowing bronze, copper-bronze hue, 
in parts ringed with blood-red bands, in others with the dusky ones that I have already mentioned. These circles, both red and black, were of varying thicknesses. For a time I was at a loss to account for their presence. Then it occurred to me that it was scarcely likely that the sun would cool evenly all over, and that these markings were due probably to differences in temperature of the various areas. The red representing those parts where the heat was still fervent, and the black, those portions which were already comparatively cool. It struck me as a peculiar thing that the sun should cool in evenly defined rings, until I remembered that possibly they were but isolated patches to which the enormous rotary, rotatory speed of the sun had imparted a belt-like appearance. The sun itself was very much greater than the sun I had known in the old world days, and from this I argued that it was considerably nearer. At nights, the moon still showed, but small and remote, and the light she reflected was so dull and weak that she seemed little more than the small, dim ghost of the olden moon that I had known. Gradually, the days and nights lengthened out until they equaled a space somewhat less than one of the old earth hours, the sun rising and setting like a great ruddy bronze disk crossed with ink-black bars. About this time, I found myself able once more to see the gardens with clearness, for the world had now grown very still and changeless. Yet I am not correct in saying gardens, for there were no gardens, nothing that I knew or recognized. In place thereof, I looked out upon a vast plain, stretching away into distance. A little to my left, there was a low range of hills. Everywhere there was a uniform white covering of snow, in places rising into hummocks and ridges. It was only now that I recognized how really great had been the snowfall. In places it was vastly deep, as was witnessed by a great upleaping, wave-shaped hill away to my right. Though it is not impossible that this was due in part to some rise in the surface of the ground. Strangely enough, the range of low hills to my left, already mentioned, was not entirely covered with the universal snow. Instead, I could see their bare, dark sides showing in several places, and everywhere and always there reigned an incredible death silence and desolation, the immutable, awful quiet of a dying world. All this time the days and nights were lengthened perceptively. Already each day occupied maybe some two hours from dawn to dusk. At night I had been surprised to find that there were very few stars overhead, and these small, though of an extraordinary brightness, which I attributed to the peculiar but clear blackness of the night time. Away to the north I could discern a nebulous sort of mistiness, not unlike in appearance a small portion of the Milky Way. It might have been an extremely remote star cluster, or the thought came to me suddenly, perhaps it was the sidereal universe that I had known, and now left far behind forever, a small, dimly glowing mist of stars far in the depths of space. Still, the days and nights lengthened, slowly. Each time the sun rose duller than it had set, and the dark belts increased in breadth. About this time there happened a fresh thing. The sun, earth, and sky were suddenly darkened and apparently blotted out for a brief space. I had a sense, a certain awareness, I, I could learn little of by sight, that the earth was enduring a very great fall of snow. Then in an instant the veil that had obscured everything vanished and I looked out once more. A marvelous sight met my gaze. The hollow in which this house with its gardens, stands, was brimmed with snow. It lipped over the sill of my window. Everywhere it lay, a great level stretch of white, which caught and reflected gloomily the somber, coppery glows of the dying sun. The world had become a shadowless plain, from horizon to horizon. I glanced up at the sun. It shone with an extraordinary dull clearness. I saw it now as one who, until then, had seen it only through a partially obscuring medium. All about it, the sun had become black, with a clear, deep blackness, frightful in its nearness and its unmeasured deep, and its utter unfriendliness. For a great time I looked into it, 
newly and shaken and fearful. It was so near. Had I been a child, I might have expressed some of my sensation and distress by saying that the sky had lost its roof. Later, I turned and peered about me into the room. Everywhere, it was covered with a thin shroud of the all-pervading white. I could see it but dimly by reason of the somber light that now lit the world. It appeared to cling to the ruined walls, and the thick, soft dust of the years that covered the floor knee-deep was nowhere visible. The snow must have been blown in through the open framework of the windows, yet in no place had it drifted, but lay everywhere about the great old room, smooth and level. Moreover, there had been no wind these many thousand years. But there was the snow, as I have told. And all the earth was silent, and there was a cold such as no living man can ever have known. The earth was now illuminated by day with a most doleful light, beyond my power to describe. It seemed as though I looked at the great plain through the medium of a bronze-tinted sea. It was evident that the Earth's rot rotatory movement was departing steadily. The end came all at once. The night had been the longest yet, and when the dying sun showed at last above the world's edge, I had grown so wearied of the dark that I greeted it as a friend. It rose steadily until about 20 degrees above the horizon. Then it stopped suddenly and after a strange retrograde movement hung motionless a great shield in the sky. Only the circular rim of the sun showed bright, only this and one thin streak of light near the equator. Gradually, even this thread of light died out, and now all that was left of our great and glorious sun was a vast dead disk rimmed with a thin circle of bronze-red light. <sighs> Tomorrow night at 10, Eastern Standard Time. Chapter 18. The Green Star. 